Okay, our reader is Dorothy Adamson. Good morning. The first, the first reading is from the 65th chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 9. And I hope you all read in your bulletin what is printed before the reading because it leads into this reading so well. You understand it better. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with a broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord, because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster and they say, do not destroy it for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servants' sakes and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. Here ends the first reading. This morning's second reading is from the third chapter of Galatians, beginning with the 23rd verse. Now before faith came, we were in prison and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer a subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offerings, heirs according to the promise. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the eighth chapter, beginning with the 26th verse. The Holy Gospel is from Luke, Chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the county of Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me, for Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven, driven by the demon into the wilds. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herds rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding county of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. 
The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, peace, and power to be with you from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the bright red day of Pentecost, just two weeks ago, we heard all about God's deeds of power, hearing in a new way, as opposed to the Tower of Babel that was all about uplifting man's deeds of power. Pentecost is all about God's power. Last week, it was a festival Sunday, all in white on Holy Trinity Sunday. The message was all about how we are invited into the dance of the Trinity, traveling and navigating into the mystery and mission as we move forward, fueled and powered by the Holy Spirit who provides power as we move forward together. And our God as three in one, three in one expressions moving together, and we are invited as people of Christ, as children of God moving forward, invited into the dance of the Holy Trinity, moving us forward as a church united together. And so today, we enter into the long green season of Pentecost. The season goes all the way till Thanksgiving. And so the theme surfaces again as God's power. In this section of Luke, we focus on God's power over the demoniac or this unclean spirit. And it's nestled between two other stories of power. God's power over the wind and the waves. And then after this gospel comes God's power over healing a girl who was sick. So Pentecost, as we enter into Pentecost, feel the power. So in the gospel story today, we enter and we encounter this demoniac, this man with the unclean spirit. He was societally less than human. He wore no clothes. He did not live in a house. Instead, he lived in the tombs. He did not have a name. He was bound in shackles and chains. And he was driven out into the abyss, into the wilderness. For this man was totally dehumanized. How about in our world? Are there people that are dehumanized? Are there nameless people that are driven out to the outcasts of society? Yes, there are. In fact, just in India alone, there are 300 million people who are treated as less than humans. Actually, they're treated less than dogs in India, less than animals. They're called Dalits. Yes, 300 million, that's is almost as many people as that live in the United States. Dehumanizing is unjust. The caste system is a lie. And the fact that this happens on our planet is not okay. Does dehumanizing happen in our own communities? Yes, it does. And we don't even realize that it happens with small or large segments of our population that we do not understand. Dehumanizing takes place. There's lots of examples that might come to your own mind at this time. However, just a few that come to my mind. When you shoot a person on a video game, that's dehumanizing. When you look at people as objects, uh, that's dehumanizing. Judging large groups of people rather than having a conversation with one individual from that group is dehumanizing. However, one of the examples I would like to highlight today is in the area of mental health. 
with harmful language and our historically naive understandings of mental health, uh, we have dehumanized people or we have been dehumanized ourselves. Our community has needed a lot of education and uh, communities across the country have as well. There's a lot that uh, we have gained in our understanding and awareness of mental health, but there's a long ways that we still need to go in this area. And through, through various efforts, we have come a long way. And thank God for this, because dehumanizing happens here and now, and it's, it's never a good thing. Dehumanizing happens in Jesus' time in a big way. In Jesus' day, there was a major gap in understanding people. Perhaps this person had a mental illness. Perhaps not. The Bible said he had a demon and had an unclean spirit. Perhaps that's not what matters. What does matter is that Jesus broke down all of the barriers and the walls and he did not pay attention to what the crowds were doing and he honed in on that man and he came to him and broke through everything and spoke to this man as an individual. The first thing he said to this nameless man is, what is your name? This is a beautiful question. And then the man said, Legion, for we are many. Legion here is a military reference of 6,000 Roman soldiers. In other words, this man had a lot of voices and a whole army of spirits plaguing him. So Jesus exercises his power with an exorcism. Yes, there over on the hillside, there was a herd of pigs, and Jesus cast out demons from this man, and the evil spirits all zoomed over there and went into this pack of pigs. Immediately, the pigs went down into the lake and drowned there in the sins that were cast upon the swine. For this is kind of like a half baptism, I like to think of it as. A half baptism is, the first part of the baptism is that you're drowning. And the next part is that Christ raises you up. This is a half baptism because it was just, boom, it was the drowning part, casting the demons out. And I like to think of this as deviled ham as well. Amen? <laughs> Not quite as appetizing, but it is deviled ham. Yes, Jesus has the power to cast out demons. But the gospel good news for us today is that Jesus has the power to humanize. And we see this in the gospel story. The crowds were looking for this man. Where did they find him? They didn't find him in some tomb. They didn't find him uh, wandering off or running away to get away. No, they found him at the feet of Jesus. Not naked, but with clothes on. Not possessed, but in his right mind. Interestingly, the crowds are not liking this. The crowds are, they fear that this man was changed. They're not comfortable with this. The crowds, usually in the Bible, are code for fear, aggression, mob mentality, and either there's this great need for healing from Jesus as they come and the, the crowds try to get him to, have, to touch Jesus' cloak or robe for healing, or the crowds are clamorous and they're trying to then eventually crucify Jesus. So the masses, or the crowds, ironically here, are dehumanized just in their sort of description. But despite the crowd's fear, Jesus beautifully pays no attention to those crowds, and here he gets face to face with his beloved. This man who was healed and radically changed, they're sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says to him with joy, he says to the, he says, this. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. The sermon title today is for you because it was going to be the world's longest sermon title and that would have been what Jesus says, but that would have been too long on our bulletin. Return home and tell how much God has done for you. I just put it for you. And so this man went to proclaim the good news, this life-changing good news of Jesus. Jesus has the power to heal and humanize, make human. 
For you and you and you and all of us here today, Jesus has the power to make you, you. You are not just part of the crowds. You do not live your life in fear. You have your own thoughts and your own feelings, your, old, your own worldview and perspective. Nobody stands in your shoes, or I see some are wearing sandals, except, uh, except you. No one. You are uniquely and wonderfully made. So Jesus looks at you today as you sit at the foot of the cross of Christ, as you sit at Jesus' feet, Jesus says to you, you are you, and thank God for that. This gift of healing and redemption is for you. Yes, all around the world, Jesus says this to his beloved, even for the Dalits who are treated as less than dogs. The Dalits are the fastest growing segment of Lutherans in India, by far. Also, one of the fastest growing Christian populations in the entire world. They resonate with the humanity of Jesus Christ who was stricken and esteemed not, who was of humble origins, who came in a meek and mild way. They resonate with this Jesus, this one who became human. And so in India, wonderful things are happening with this Dalit community and the Lutheran community as well. Mother Teresa lived with these Dalits and devoted her life to the lowest and least of these. Our Northeast Minnesota sister church is there in India, and this was highlighted at this year's Synod Assembly. We met Lutheran pastors from this area, and we were really engaged in the story that they had to tell us. So let us not refer to the theys or those people of the world in a negative or naive way. Rather, let us understand individuals with the Pentecost power to hear and understand each in their own language or perspective or worldview or their own belief system. Let us move forward together into the mystery, fueled and propelled and powered by our three-in-one God who is with us always as the Holy Trinity working in our lives. And then let us grow green and live and grow together in this really, really long season of Pentecost as we live and love and grow and groan and serve and sing together as humans, each with our own colorful ways. Let us grow vibrant as plants do this time of year as we serve and live together. Just as well, we have our sins that stain our clothing and our souls, we have those things that taint our lives. We are haunted by unclean spirits or by demons in our world. And so week after week, we come to be drowned and raised in the waters of baptism, to be drowned and raised to newness of life as we come and we worship on Wednesdays and Sundays regularly here in this place. We come once again every Sunday or Wednesday to sit at the feet of Jesus who calls us and claims us as his beloved children. And Jesus says to us, as he said to that man with the unclean spirit, return to your homes and tell all of the great things that God has done for you. Amen.